So we're now going to apply the Lagrange multiplier technique to a more complicated problem. So we're going to keep the same surface, which is going to be this unit sphere, but now we're going to have a more complicated function that we're going to try and find the stationary points of over that surface. And of course, by finding the stationary points, we're then going to be able to find the maximum and the minimum. Now, initially I did say we were going to do this with this function that I wrote down here. I have actually just attempted to film that video where we do this. It's not nice. The algebra gets a little bit long and tedious, so I've changed my mind. We're going to simplify it. We're going to take away the plus z, which I hope is going to adequately simplify it to make the algebra less long and tedious. So with that previous problem, you can attempt to do that at home. It's very, very easy to write down the four equations that the Grange multiplier method gives you. It's just then solving those four equations, finding all the solutions to those four equations is quite long and quite tedious. You can do it, but it is long and tedious, so we're not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to simplify the problem, and we're now just dealing with this function x cubed plus y squared, which I hope is going to be simpler. Now, even with this simplification, it's not going to be as simple as the previous problem. The previous problem was beautiful because we only had two stationary points on the sphere for that function. With this one, I suspect we're going to end up with far more than two stationary points. So we're going to then have to go through all of those different stationary points at the end and look at what the value of the function is at each of them and find which one is the biggest and which one is the smallest. And of course, some of the stationary points, it might be the case that the biggest value that you get is obtained by two of the different stationary points, i.e. two different points on the sphere both obtain the same maximum value. So things can be more complicated now. What we can be sure of is that we don't have to worry about this sort of thing happening in the like we saw in the one-dimensional case where you had these edges and the maximum and minimum was actually obtained at a non-stationary point. No, because the sphere doesn't have edges like that, we can be sure that where the maximum and minimum is obtained, that that is a stationary point. So let's firstly just get some intuition for this problem. And the way we're going to do this is just have a look uh, for some of the points on the surface of this sphere. What does this function actually equal? So we'll just take our simple points. So 1, 0, 0, firstly, you can see plugging in 1 here, you get the answer, uh, well, 1, 0, 0. Uh, you get the answer 1. So here the function takes on the value of 1. If we look at the point 0, 1, 0, Again, you can see the function takes on the value 1 there. If we look at the point 0, 0, 1, you can see the function is 0 there. If we look at the point 0, 0, minus 1, again, the function is 0 there. If we look at this point over here, 0, minus 1, 0, that gives again the value 1. And then if you look at the value, the point minus 1, 0, 0, that gives the function value minus 1. So, here it's 1, here it's 1, here it's 1, here it's 0, here it's 0, here it's minus 1. So we might think maybe the biggest value the function takes on over this sphere is the value 1. So here, 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 it's taking on the maximum value. And maybe the smallest value it can ever equal is minus 1. So maybe here it's taking on the minimum value. And the sort of argument behind that might be, oh, you can see that the moment you sort of make the x and the y smaller away from these most extreme points on the sphere, then cubing and squaring is going to massively shrink them. You know, if you take a number smaller than one, like let's say three quarters, and you cube it, it gets much smaller. Cubing makes things smaller when their modulus is less than one. And same with squaring. So, that's the sort of intuition we might have for why maybe 1 is the largest value the function can take on. Maybe there is no way that you can sort of go to an intermediate point on the sphere and get a larger value of this function. Well, we don't know the answer to that yet. We're going to find out. Are there actually bigger values of this function on that unit sphere? Let's find out now using Lagrange multipliers. So we already know the normal vectors to our surface. So they are 2x. 2y, 2z. So we now want points on the surface where this vector is parallel or anti-parallel, i.e. a multiple, the Lagrange multiple, of 
the gradient vector of our function. So what is the gradient vector of our function? Well, this is simple. Partial derivative with respect to x is 3x squared. Partial derivative with respect to y is 2y. And then partial derivative with respect to z is 0. And this is the bit that I'm hoping is going to massively simplify the algebra in this case. So now if we want to write down the four equations that we've got, we've got the x squared plus y squared plus z squared is equal to 1. We've got that 3x squared must equal lambda, whoops, let's put the 2 out the front so it looks nicer, 2 lambda times x, and then 2y must equal 2 lambda times y, and then we've immediately got that z must equal 0. So that immediately excludes a huge part of the sphere. So none of these points where z is not equal to 0 are going to be stationary points. All of them are going to lie on the circle, effectively, that's in the xy plane, the intersection of the xy plane with our unit sphere. So let's now solve these equations then. So what it is very tempting and very wrong to do is to cancel the y here and one of the x's here. That's what we would have done when we were 13 without a care in the world, but that is not a valid algebraic manipulation. It's almost a valid algebraic manipulation. You see, in formal algebra, what you are doing when you cancel the y, let's say, there, is you're really multiplying through the, by the multiplicative inverse of y. You're multiplying both sides by 1 over y. Now, 1 over y will always exist as long as y doesn't equal 0. So when you change this equation to 2 is equal to 2 lambda, it's almost the same equation, but it's not. It, it has lost a solution, which is the solution that y could have equaled 0. So this equation has the solution y is equal to 0, whereas the new equation that you would get, which is 2 is equal to 2 lambda, that doesn't have the solution y is equal to 0. So you lose solutions when you do that. And it's because when you did the algebraic manipulation, you were assuming that y doesn't equal 0 because you assumed that the multiplicative inverse of y existed. So it's not a good algebraic manipulation. What we need to do is be more careful. We need to split it into cases. So firstly, let's start with x. We need to split it into the two cases where x is equal to zero and x doesn't equal zero. So let's firstly consider the case where x is equal to zero. So this equation is vacuously satisfied the moment x is equal to zero. So now let's consider the... We now need to case split it again for y. So let's consider the case where y is equal to zero. Now, is that even possible? If y is equal to zero, this one is satisfied. So we've got this satisfied, this satisfied, and this satisfied. But oh dear, our top one isn't satisfied in this case. We've got zero, zero, zero is equal to one. No. So actually, this doesn't give us any solutions. So we don't need to worry about that. So if x is equal to zero, it must be the case that y doesn't equal zero. Case two that we've got here. So if y doesn't equal 0, now it is valid to divide through by y, to multiply through by y's multiplicative inverse, because y will always have a multiplicative inverse as long as it's not equal to 0. So we then get the equation that 2 is equal to 2 lambda, which tells us what lambda is now equal to. Lambda must equal 1. So this equation is satisfied this equation is satisfied, this one is satisfied, so we just now need to actually make sure that this one is satisfied. So we know what the x value is, it's zero. We know what the z value is, it's zero. We don't yet know what the y value is, we just know that it's not zero. So we must find the y value so that it satisfies this. That gives us that y squared must equal one. So we get that y is equal to plus or minus one. So actually the points that we have here are zero, one, zero, and lambda is equal to one and then 0 minus 1, 0, lambda is equal to 1. And we saw when we were looking at this problem intuitively that both of those points give the f value equal to 1, which was our speculated possible maximum value. So we're still wondering, are there any better solutions than that? Are there any places where the function gets to a higher value than 1? We'll find out. So that 
is the case where x equals zero. Let's now go to the case where x doesn't equal zero. And again, we need to split it into two cases. We need to split it into the case where y equals zero and where y doesn't equal zero. And this time, I suspect that the case where y does equal zero is going to actually have a solution this time. So if y equals zero, this one is satisfied. We know this one is satisfied. So we just now need to make sure that these two are satisfied. So x doesn't equal zero this time. So we can algebraically cancel it. We can multiply through by its multiplicative inverse. So we'll get then that 3x is equal to 2 lambda. So we've got this equation. We've also got the equation up here, which will tell us what the value of x is equal to. So if we put in y is equal to 0 and z is equal to 0, then we get that x must equal plus or minus 1. And then from this and this, we can work out the lambda value for each of those. So if x is equal to 1, then lambda is going to equal 3 over 2, I believe. Let's just check that. So 3 times 1 divided by 2, yes. If x is equal to minus 1, then lambda is going to equal minus 3 over 2. So the two solutions we get out of that are 1, 0, 0, and then lambda is equal to 3 over 2, and then minus 1, 0, 0, and in that case, lambda is equal to minus 3 over 2. So again, points that we looked at with a huge amount of interest. Um, this point, remember, had f value equal to 1, and this point had f value equal to minus 1. And what our technique is now telling us is that those are both stationary points. Um, so potentially, that value could be the maximum value that the function obtains. No, and the minimum value that the function obtains at minus 1, 0, 0. Now let's do the final case, which is when x doesn't equal 0 and y doesn't equal 0. And this is the one where the algebra is potentially going to get nasty. So because both of them don't equal 0, then we can perform the cancellation. So we get that 3x is equal to 2 lambda. And we can get that 2 is equal to 2 lambda. Um, so that tells us that lambda is equal to 1 immediately from this equation. And that's the only way that equation is going to be satisfied if y is not equal to 0, that lambda must equal 1. From lambda is equal to 1, we can get what x must equal. So x must equal 2 thirds. And now we need to plug that into the top equation so this one here, to see if we can get a y value that works. So we've got that 2 thirds squared. We know that z is equal to 0, so plus y squared must equal 1. So 2 thirds squared is 4 ninths, so we then get that y squared is equal to 5 ninths. So y is equal to plus or minus the square root of 5 over so the two solutions, the two stationary points that we get out of that are um, two thirds root five over three, zero, and lambda is equal to one. And then the other one, which is two thirds, and then this time minus root five over three, zero. And again, that has a Lagrange multiplier equal to one. So overall, we have now solved all the different cases and got all the solutions to our system of four equations. So here is one, here is one, here is one, here is one, and then we've got these two up here as well, this one and this one. So all of those six points, so 0, 1, 0, 0, minus 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, negative 1, 0, 0, and then... 2 thirds root 5 over 3, 0, 2 thirds minus root 5 over 3, 0. These are all stationary points of our function f on that uh, unit sphere. So now we just need to work out what the maximum and minimum value of the function is. So we need to just look at what the value of the function is at each of these. So we already know that it's 1 here, 1 here, 1 here. In fact, I'll circle these negative 1 at this one. So it's just these two down here that are the interesting ones, and we need to see, do they actually beat 
any of these values? Do they give higher or lower values than we've already got? So plugging this in, so remember our function is x cubed plus y squared. So 2 thirds cubed is going to give 8 over, and 3 cubed is 27, plus y squared is going to give 5 over 9, and you're going to get the same answer for both of them. So let's now add this together. So we get 8 plus 15 over 27, which gives us um, 23 over 27. So no, it doesn't. It gives a smaller value. So this stationary point is not a global maximum over the entire unit sphere. And this one gives the exact same value. So no, these are not going to change what the value of the maximum and minimum is. So actually, our guesses were right. The maximum value that this function obtains over the unit sphere is 1, and it obtains it at multiple points. It obtains it here, it obtains it here, and it obtains it here. So there are these three points that we've got here, this one, this one, and this one, where it obtains that maximum value. And then its minimum value is minus 1, and it obtains that at only one point, which is this point, minus 1, 0, 0. Then there are two additional stationary points that aren't global extrema, they might be local extrema, or potentially they're not local extrema, they might be analogous to points of inflection in the uh, single variable calculus case, uh, but there are these two additional stationary points where the directional derivative in any direction that is in the tangent plane to the surface at that point is zero. So we'll end there. Thank you for watching and I hope you found the video useful.